The Public Safety and Security Policy and Finance Committee will come to order and we will begin with the roll call. Johnson. Lomer. Here. Hillstrom. Here. Beckerfin. Here. Considine. Dean. Here. Frankie. Grossel. Here. Howe. Lucero. Newberger. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Uglum. Here. Ward. Here. Zerwas. Here. Thank you. So I would look for a motion to approve the minutes for March 13th. Uh, Representative Grossel, have you had a chance to look at the minutes? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move we approve the minutes. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Okay, we'll start with House File 2800. Welcome, Representative Barr. It's nice to have you in our committee this morning. So, Representative Barr, I will move that House File 2800 be re-referred to the General Register. And again, welcome to the committee and please explain your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I also wanna mention, it's this, this is my first time up in your committee and I did bring treats, but I've asked the page to pass them out after because I really feel that this is a serious topic and. Maybe all of your topics are serious, but just given the nature of this. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you so much. Um, Madam Chair, thank you for hearing and members uh, the bill today, House File 2800. This bill serves to expand the definition of what can be defined as a crime as it relates to criminal sexual contact. And specifically, it is expanded to include the non-consensual intentional touching of the clothing, clothing covering the immediate area of the buttocks. And I think most of us have not been immune to what's been going on nationally. Um, quite frankly, I've been horrified about some of the stories that have come out over the past year. And then of course, more recently, we've had a number of issues occurring here at the state level. And I know for myself, I was very sad and angry to hear um, of some of the things that were, were going on. Um, and as a result of that, I, I wanted to take a look at what was legal and illegal under the law. And when I took a look at this particular statute, I was surprised to find uh, what was excluded from this law. And we can all make our own opinion and judgment on as to why that may have happened. But um, I felt strongly that we needed to close this little loophole in the law. And that is the intent of the bill. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Representative Barr. Do you have any testifiers? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, we do have a testifier on behalf of the bill. Great. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Caroline Palmer and I'm the Public and Legal Affairs Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And I am here in, to speak in support of the bill and to thank Representative Barr for bringing this forward. We really appreciate it. I just wanna give you a little bit of brief background. On several occasions, I've actually been asked the question whether or not it's illegal under our criminal sexual conduct laws to touch somebody's clothed buttocks. And I have to say, it may be illegal, but not in the way that you expect it. It's, it's not a violation under our criminal sexual conduct codes. Maybe it's an assault, maybe it's disorderly conduct. But um, that is not going to match the way that a victim might feel when they are violated in this way. And I wanna give you one example. Um, a, I had a recent conversation with somebody who was at a work event, actually surrounded by colleagues. And she was, groped it at that event um, and sent suggestive sexual texts at the same time. And it was a very intense groping that occurred. Um, she is a survivor of sexual assault and she said that she felt pretty violated after that just as much as she did from the sexual assault before. Um, she has reported it and they are working it through the system. But what they found is that they couldn't uh, charge this under crim sex five. Um, and she doesn't really feel like the potential punishment that might come really fits the violation that she feels. And we hear about these examples all of the time. I also wanna note that it is really significant that we are talking about this in the context of the Me Too movement. And I think at Mincasa, we know how complex this conversation is right now. And we recognize that um, there have been all levels of conversation and concerns about due process. 
But we also recognize that for a victim who has been groped in this way, it can be an act of sexual objectification and humiliation, and we want to honor that in our laws. So and in that respect, I just wanted to say thank you again to Representative Barr and to the committee. And um, I do have a research intern here, Kelsey Meyer. She actually took the step of looking at all of the states in our country, including the territories too. Very thorough to look at all the different states. And so if you have any specific questions about um, how Minnesota stacks up uh, about states around the country, we can certainly give you that information. Thank you. Any questions from members? Any Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Barr, for bringing this forward. It was something I had looked at earlier in session as well. And I happened to notice that this statute was allowed, I guess, well, this activity was allowed back in 1988. Do you have any history as to why? I mean, why would this be in our statutes to begin with? And do you have any history as to why 1988 was the year that they uh, basically made this allowable in our law. Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative O'Neill. Um, I did try to do a little bit of research and very high level was not able to really get at why that was excluded and I just let it go and part of me had the curiosity to wonder who on earth would allow this to be included and I thought maybe that was better that I didn't know that as well too because um, I thought for me what was really important is that it's here today and we need to clean up the language. So I hope that helps answer your question. Uh, Mr. Dibble might have some more information on that. Mr. Chair and members, I have an article from May of 1987 where it discusses the amendment this was included in the original legislation, but uh, Senator, I will name names, Senator Speer made an amendment to exclude it and he's quoted as saying, I, I don't want anyone to think this is proper behavior, but sometimes we must make a distinction between behavior that is improper and unsocial and behavior that we ought to criminalize. Anyone from the audience wish to uh, comment on this? Uh, Representative Barr, any last uh, comments you'd like to make? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just make one comment on that statement. Um, I think it often depends on the context and the person who is receiving on the receiving end of that behavior. And I can tell you there's probably almost no work situation for me that that would be acceptable. So um, thank you for hearing the bill and I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make the, uh, I'll reaffirm the motion to re-refer the House File 2800 to the General Register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, with that, I will ask the page to pass out the treats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> Next, uh, Representative Fenton. I'll be uh, again. <clears throat> welcome to the committee. Members, I'll make a motion to re refer House File 3371 to the General Register. Please introduce yourself and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Representative Kelly Fenton, and I want to tell you how House File 3371 came about. Um, I, over the summer, read an article uh, that happened in New York, the state of New York, in which a young 18-year-old was um, arrested, and after her arrest, she had claimed that she had been raped. And the peace officer said it was consensual. And so as a result of the article, the author went and um, looked at other states and what was happening. And I was appalled to see that the state of Minnesota was on that map as having no criminal penalties for this at all. So House File 3371 does a few things. 
This bill creates two new criminal sexual conduct offenses specific to peace officers. It prohibits a peace officer from sexually penetrating, which is section one, or sexually contacting section two, a person in the custody of the peace officer. And a peace officer would not be entitled to assert the victim consent as a defense. Um, additionally, this bill does still allow an exception for lawful searches. So with that, um, I do have uh, one uh, testifier here on behalf of this bill. Welcome to the committee. If you could, uh, <clears throat> could introduce yourself and then begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Caroline Palmer. I'm the Public and Legal Affairs Manager of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I am here to speak in support of the bill and to thank Representative Fenton for bringing it forward. Um, the premise of this bill, I think, is pretty straightforward, and I think this is another instance in which people are surprised that the law doesn't already cover this. Um, there should be no sexual contact or penetration of a person who's engaged with a police officer, and yet this does happen in our state. And the way I know this is because um, at Mincasa we work with 70 different sexual assault advocacy programs around the state, and I hear this. I hear this often. But what we also know is that victims don't report because they feel like there's going to be some form of retaliation, harassment, or something that might accompany it. And um, that's the reason why we don't hear about these cases very often. But when I emailed our, our group of members, they, many of them said this was a very familiar circumstance. Um, I want to really point out and, and assert that we don't believe this is a common problem to all of law enforcement. We, we know that this is an exception, but we believe this is something that needs to be covered in the law. Um, some of the examples that I received from our member programs included incidences that happened during trafficking stops, um, and there's been additional harassment that have accompanied that in rare instances when a report has been made by about a fellow officer's actions. Um, sometimes activities have occurred in the jail, um, which it, you know may or may not be an issue depending on if we're considering those corrections officers, but it could be in the intake process where people have run into concerns. And a key area where it happens quite a bit is in instances where a person is stopped for prostitution um, and they are have a sexual de favor demanded in exchange for having the charge not followed up on. And I'm particularly concerned about that one because I think we've done a lot of good work in our state recognizing issues around prostitution and providing services and support to people who are um, in prostitution. And that seems to be continuing a bias against a group of people and a tool that's being used against them. So I really I really want to thank you very much for considering this change in the law and uh, we think it's very appropriate and it definitely happens and I appreciate your support. Thank you. I believe uh, Representative Beckerpin has an amendment for this as well. Yeah, thank you Mr. Chair. So I would uh, move the A1 amendment and uh, so what this does, and I, I've talked to Representative Fenton a, about this, so I, I believe I probably read the same article um, that you referenced initially and uh, also had constituents reach out to me and other people. So as many of you know, I, I work in the domestic violence field and so I had a lot of people reaching out to me who were uh, shared concerns about Minnesota being one of the states where this is not technically illegal and this amendment uh, specifically Specifically, I had uh, a friend who works in criminal appeals and uh, a friend uh, who works uh, in uh, sexual violence uh, advocacy reach out to me to uh, relay situations where the person would not have technically been in custody um, but still didn't feel that they could leave in the presence of an officer in uniform carrying a gun. And uh, so this is just um, changes the language a little bit so it makes sure that we're actually closing the loophole we think that we're closing because the term in custody um, is, is relatively narrow uh, under the law. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if other members have them. Any questions from members? Representative Fett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to verify one thing, if that's okay, and perhaps have our nonpartisan um, research uh, discuss. I think this is a friendly amendment, but can you talk a little bit about what constructive um, res uh, restraint in the amendment? 
Mr. Dibble. Mr. Chair and members, constructive restraint is when the officer is using his authority and position of power to effectively restrain the person. It's in contrast to being physically restrained, which you would envision being in the back of a squad car or handcuffed in some way where it's a clear physical incapacitation or limitation on the person's ability to leave. It's akin to the last clause in the amendment, which states that the um, person did not feel free to leave. So it would be related to that analysis and it would be on a fact uh, situation by situation analysis based on the overall circumstances and what a reasonable person would believe to uh, believe they're, <coughs> were they allowed to leave the presence of the peace officer. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, thank you, and thank you, Representative Beckerfin. I uh, This is definitely a, friend, a friendly amendment. When she and I discussed this, we both said we want to do this uh, right, and we want to do it right the first time. So I um, ask that your members um, vote yes on this amendment. Any other questions on or comments on the amendment? Is that on the amendment? Not on the amendment. Okay. All those in favor of this amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Amendment is at, added. Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll support the bill, but again, I worked in lax institutions for 28 years, had training virtually every year, and it was always crystal clear that having sex with an inmate, having sex with somebody in custody was illegal. There would be nothing that would get you not only fired, but hauled in front of a judge faster than to have sex with somebody that was in your charge. They were considered vulnerable at that point, and you were in a position of authority. I'm guessing that Representative Groslow, uh, Representative Johnson, are there any other law enforcement, uh, former law enforcement people here, will tell you the same thing, that it was crystal clear that having sex with somebody that was you had power over is against the law. Um, I saw the thing on Facebook. I had a number of my constituents email me and say, will you take this up? And it is absolutely against the law in Minnesota to have sex with somebody that you have power over. Um, Again, I don't have a problem with it. If it makes it a little clearer, I'll support it. But I don't want people thinking that it's rampant in Minnesota um, because it it's not. And it's, like I say, every training that I ever went to for 20-some years, they made it crystal clear that if you t if you touched somebody inappropriately, you were going to be fired and hauled in front of a judge and prosecuted for it. I can remember stopping a female in inmate that called me honey and said, no, you don't get to do that. Um, it just sort of irritates me that, that it's, somebody would think that that was true in Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Constein. Um, you're absolutely right. In state law, it is um, illegal for a correction officer to have sex with an inmate. Unfortunately, the peace officer is not part of that um, law, and that is what I'm doing here. I went to all, I asked all of my friends in law enforcement, because I'm a huge supporter of our law enforcement officers, and they, um, a few of them were absolutely shocked to find out. When they went back and looked, they did. They said, you're right, correction officers are, uh, it is against the law in the state for correction officers, but not for peace officers, and this is what that does. I'll, I'll, I'll pass, thanks. Any, any other questions from members? Is there any public testimony on this bill? Okay, then I will re-refer, make motion to re-refer uh, House File 3371 to the General Register. <coughs> As amended, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Representative Grossel. Yeah, 
doesn't seem to want to go full screen. Members, Representative Graffel <coughs> moves to uh, refer uh, House File 2934 to civil law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll move to have it referred to civil law from here, please. Thank you. Uh, please state your, state your name and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and committee members, uh, Representative Grossel. And uh, this bill before you today was a bill is a bill that uh, for states of adjudication to be made available and uh, for those who are asking for uh, background checks done on bus drivers so that these states of adjudication will be made available as a, uh, a for any disqualifying uh, charges they're already they're already on the file that uh, uh, Anything that they've been convicted of, as far as a disqualifying charge or a conviction, that uh, it will come out in the background check. But at this point, right now, um, stays of adjudication are not. And this bill is to uh, allow the BCA to also uh, inform those who are doing background checks for for uh, bus driver licenses that. It would allow them to have the knowledge that this person has a state of adjudication for a disqualifying offense so that they can make a, uh, a clear and informed decision on whether or not to uh, hire this person. I'm going to start out with a, uh, just a short video clip, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. The school, the bus drive, the bus company, who's ever hiring them. You're also trusting the state, which licenses and background checks school bus drivers. But a CARE 11 investigation discovered that may be a misplaced trust. That makes me very nervous. 52-year-old Glenn David Johnson was, until last week, a school bus driver, transporting kids to and from Blaine High, Roosevelt Middle, and Jefferson Elementary. He was arrested, accused of touching teen girls. And Carol Levin has learned it's not the first time. No question that there uh, appears to be a concerning pattern of conduct uh, going back now uh, about 20 years. Paul Young with the Anoka County Attorney's Office prosecuted Glenn Johnson back in 1998. The police report shows the then 32-year-old admitted he rubbed an underage girl's privates. But Young says because of complicated circumstances with the victim, a conviction was no sure thing. This was a very difficult case. So a plea deal was reached. Johnson pled guilty and received a stay of adjudication, which means he was sentenced to probation for two years, but after that, there would be no conviction on his record. We didn't reach the perfect result, but the risk of an acquittal or the need to have to outright dismissal was very real. That stay of adjudication Johnson received is not technically a conviction. Minnesota law only disqualifies bus drivers who have convictions. So a man who admitted to sexually assaulting a young girl is legally allowed to drive them to school. If they admitted they're guilty, they, they still, that should be a law, that they can't be anywhere near a child. Both the school district and the bus company tell us they were unaware of Johnson's history. That's not surprising. For months, Carol Evans has been reporting on how stays of adjudication have resulted in secret sex offenders in Minnesota. Their crimes kept largely confidential by the court system, sometimes with tragic results. All in favor say aye. In response, a bill that completely bans stays of adjudication has been introduced, as have more moderate measures that would increase transparency. While lawmakers debate what is the best fix, parents are left to wonder just who is driving their kids. They should not be able to be anywhere near a child on driving bus or anything. Glenn Johnson has not been convicted of his latest charges and the sexual assault he's current. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is uh, a case that that brought this to my attention and as to uh, the rest of us here, I imagine as well. Um, it was a case where the bus driver had uh, 
received a state of adjudication for um, a criminal sexual conduct act with a minor of the same age group, a female as well, as uh, and years later came back as a bus driver and did the same thing. Same, uh, same uh, age group, uh, a female students and you know, accused of, of uh, touching them or you know, what, what, whatever the charge, uh, the complete charge was. And so this is something that I want to, I want to uh, aid schools to protect the children better. And so this will take the, this will take the uh, state of adjudication portion and make it a, uh, and make it discoverable during the background checks. So again, like I said, the school can make a, a good informed decision on whether or not this person should be transporting children. The okay, first testifier we have is uh, Carolyn Palmer. Please state your name and begin. Uh, Mr. Chair, my name is Caroline Palmer, Public and Legal Affairs Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I want to say thank you for hearing so many sexual assault bills today. It's it's great to have this conversation here at the legislature. And I want to thank Representative Grossel for being the chief author on this legislation. We've had lots of good conversations with him about this. And I just wanted to give a little bit of brief background. Um, the states of adjudication conversation did start last session and many victim advocates, including Minkasa, did weigh in. And we see that there's a balance to be struck with stays of adjudication. Um, many times they are a level of accountability that prosecutors need when a victim is too young to testify, maybe incapacitated, suffering from extreme trauma. But at the same time, we also want the system to be able to hold offenders accountable whenever they can. And so we appreciate how difficult it can be to make these decisions in, in sexual assault cases. And those are actually probably some of the most complicated cases to sometimes prosecute. So we see the balance that has to be struck here with all of these various tools. I really want to thank Representative Grossel for taking a lot of time over the past year to speak with so many different stakeholders and I think uh, we've all come to really understand where everybody's coming from and to work together in ways that I think uh, will benefit victims. Um, one thing we did agree on, for example, is that accessing information about stays of adjudication in criminal sexual conduct cases is really important for employers um, so that they know the background, particularly when there's going to be access to children or vulnerable adults, um, other folks. And so we definitely think that greater data access in this instance is very much warranted. Um, the other thing is I think it's really important that we do have the stays of adjudication um, with regard to criminal sexual conduct. Uh, as a disqualifying offense uh, for school bus drivers. Um, we've certainly heard many cases over the years where school bus drivers <coughs> have acted towards uh, children in ways that are definitely very concerning and certainly illegal. And so we're happy to see that this measure is in place too. And again, not a problem for the vast majority of drivers, but again, we have to look at the exceptions where children are in harm's way. So again, I really want to thank Representative Grossel for taking the lead on this. Um, it's important work and I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions from members. Next testifier is Carmen Quitty. <laughs> Chair and committee, we actually have two uh, testifiers from the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. My name is Ryan Else, E L S E. I'm with the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I'm also an attorney with the firm that represented Mr. Johnson, who is featured in that clip. And most importantly for what I'm going to talk about, I'm an attorney with the Veterans Defense Project. There are some very severe unintended consequences, I fear, in this bill. Um, stays of adjudication are a very special tool within the justice system that's used in my line of work, most importantly in specialty courts such as veterans courts or mental health courts um, or drug courts. And the point is to allow the person to go through whatever treatment the court deems is necessary with an agreement that they will be able to come out the backside of that treatment without a conviction. Um, for our veterans that go into veterans court, that is a very important incentive to get them to do the very difficult treatment that they need to address their 
post-traumatic stress disorder or any other service-related disorder that may have led to a crime. If you take this tool away and those people may not be convicted but they will still have a BCA record that reflects the crime, it will very much limit that tool and how effective it is for them. The Johnson case is really un unfortunate. Um, I didn't represent him when he received the state of adjudication but our firm represented him on the most recent case. I'm a father. I'm troubled by the fact that somebody can be driving my children around with that record. But I think there are much more narrowly tailored ways of approaching this that approach criminal sexual conduct cases that will not eliminate this tool throughout the justice system. And th that's my last point is that this problem is limited to criminal sexual conduct cases. I do not see a lot of people getting really upset that somebody received a stay of adjudication on a DWI, for example. Um, this, there needs to be a tool that the justice system has where somebody can avoid a conviction and earn their way out of that conviction. And this is the last remaining tool we have for that. And so I would just like that to be considered as you consider this bill. Are there any questions you'd have for myself? Representative, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and this may be a little more for Representative Grossel, but as long as this testifier is here, it kind of relates to this. Um, the transparency in this makes a lot of sense to me, and um, and uh, and I know you've been so focused on on the issue. Um, and thank you for that about um, folks who've, who've um, uh, their allegations of sexual violence, and there's been the state of adjudication. I guess as I look at this, though, it really does encompass a really wide variety of offenses. And I'm wondering, um, so it, uh, that would include, for example, if somebody has a trace amount of drugs, uh, so they get a gross misdemeanor sentence, um, and they end up getting a state of adjudication, this would cover that too, um, which is certainly a concerning situation. I just want to know, um, are you intending to and wanting to cover so many other offenses as well, in addition to the, the sex offenses we're concerned about, or, or, or might you be interested in kind of focusing, focusing this on, the, on those sex offenses? Representative Grasso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Pinto. And you, you're, you've been one that, is, that has offered to work with me on this, and I, I appreciate your input. Um, this, this bill does not, <clears throat> excuse me, does not change uh, what the statute already covers. And the list of disqualifying offenses, it, it encompasses, that's, that is what the language of it is already. Uh, mine is only adding the stays of adjudication uh, portion to it on the same disqualifying uh, offenses that are already covered in statute. So it's not, it's not broadening it, it's not asking for uh, uh, more disqualifying offenses, it's just saying that uh, this person that has, uh, that has been in court and if there is a case where uh, the prosecution cannot quite uh, take it to trial because of extenuating circumstances, but the defense looks at the case and says, you know, if I take this to trial, if I try to fight this, I could very well be convicted. So to get that stay, they're admitting to having done this act to get that stay of adjudication. So uh, for me to, to say that uh, someone who, is, uh, who has got a first degree uh, controlled substance charge or, you know, even a, a trace amount, uh, there are some, there are some uh, drug offenses already covered under the statute that say no, they shouldn't be driving a bus. So I'm not, uh, I'm not broadening it. I'm just adding these, uh, these, these cases in there. And like I said, it gives the, uh, it gives the uh, uh, school or whoever the bus, uh, the bus uh, authority, the uh, information to make a decision on whether they should proceed or not. It still allows them to, you know, if uh, if this person is in a, a situation that they can decide whether to hire them or not. So, but it, it's uh, it goes. It still goes by the disqualifying offenses that are already in statute. Thank you. 
something. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I, I want to just maybe clarify with staff that last point, because the way I read this is that if they have a state of adjudication for this gross misdemeanor drug offense or whatever it is, that it's an automatic, but maybe I'm misreading that, um, that the school district doesn't get that option to say, you know what, this person is a, is a good bus driver, we're going to keep, keep an eye on them, et cetera, but um, so just maybe we can just get clarification from staff if it is automatic versus the school district gets discretion. Again, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, you know, it's not it's not broadening or taking away from statute. It's just adding the states of adjudication in there. I may have misspoke on that. Chair, if I may address that point. Uh, go ahead. Um, page, it, my real concern is not to the text about specifically the the disqualifying offenses. It is the, the language on underlined on page four on lines 4.3 and 4.4. Um, this would cause all stays of adjudication to be reported to the BCA in a way that they are not currently. That would, outside of just the bus driving realm, that would put all of this into a BCA record that I fear completely undermines the point of a stay of adjudication. That's, that's the language that really concerns me. As far as what is a disqualifying offense, uh, that's more of the concern of <coughs> bus driver unions and people outside of my lane. But that's the language that concerns me. Uh, Mr. Dibble. Mr. Chair and members, to the specific question that was uh, raised, yes, the stay of adjudication for a disqualifying offense would be an automatic, would be the equivalent of a conviction and therefore disqualify the person from serving as a bus driver. Um, Mr. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess my concern, um, Representative Grossel, is that you know, we had heard from prosecutors um, that sometimes the flexibility of the state of adjudication is needed, as, as you described. Sometimes maybe there's not quite enough, whatever it is. And I think um, you've really argued um, well that regarding sex offenses, that may be something that you know we're really concerned about. That flex, we don't want to have that. Um, I'm concerned about a situation where you've got one of those drug offenses where right now it could be resolved the state of adjudication. Um, if that person's a bus driver, they're going to say, "Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree to stay of adjudication now because if I do, I'm going to lose my job anyway. So I may as well take it to trial, and then the prosecutor maybe just has to dismiss the case." So, so I feel like the argument was being made is just sometimes there's a flexibility needed, which we need to balance out because, as you've pointed out, that can be a problem in some offenses. I'm just wondering if, if the. Um, because I recognize you're not broadening the offenses, but it is broadening the situations where somebody gets automatically disqualified, and that may have some unintended consequences, I feel like we've been hearing from, from folks. And so I just wonder if with this bill, it might make sense to focus on the sex offenses and continue to have it be, of course, if you're convicted of one of these other things, you're disqualified. But you know, are we, are we hitting a bigger target than we need to, given the, the particular concerns you've raised? And I'm just raising this as something to think about for now, and I would love to, absolutely love to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate, I appreciate your input as well. Chair, I, I also have one other member of the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers that would like to speak on how this affects students, college students specifically. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, if you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. My name is Carmen McQuitty. I'm an attorney at the University of Minnesota Student Legal Service, as well as a, a member of MACDL. And I have to say it's nice to see some of my former colleagues um, on this committee and my representatives. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I um, share some of Representative Pinto's concerns about how broad the bill currently is. Um, I also was surprised when I heard about this. We don't want sex offenders um, driving school buses. So my issue is not with the bulk of the bill. It's really in sections when I'm looking at house research, um, the bill summary, sections four and five are my concern. And I'd like to tell you about um, my unique uh, client set. So I'm an attorney at the University of Minnesota. We have a law firm on campus just for students, but don't worry, no general fund money goes to us. We are paid by the student service fee. 
Um, so we're like a prepaid legal service. We're a full service law firm at the U. Our students get us for free if they pay that fee. I'm a criminal defense attorney and I do a criminal defense, all misdemeanors, and expungement work. So what I see is dumb college kids, 18 years old, making stupid mistakes and sometimes doing bad things, but mostly just doing dumb stuff. And a lot of them get stays of adjudication. And every client that comes into my office, one, the, one of the questions I ask them, aside from tell me about you and what you do and all the great things, is what's your biggest concern? And they always say their record. That is what they care about. Because they know in this day and age, their record, we know all companies are doing background checks now. <clears throat> And things are so competitive. And these kids, I have to tell you all, they are so much smarter than me. They are the best and the brightest. And I want them to have every opportunity whenever they are applying for jobs. So let me tell you about one case in particular. Um, I had a student who, full-time student, and also worked at Punch Pizza near campus uh, in Stadium Village. And I don't know if you remember, Punch Pizza used to do like that one day where they either give out free pizzas or it was a buy one, get one free, something like that. It was their big day. So um, somebody called in sick to work. The manager called my student, said, can you come into work today? And he said, okay, fine, I'll come in. The line was wrapped around out onto Washington Avenue, took an hour to get through line. A girl came through the line, she ordered a beer. My client checked her ID, didn't check well enough, sold her a beer, she was under 21. Actually, what happened, that was a sting operation that the city of Minneapolis decided to do on Punch's busiest day, which I had issues with as a defense attorney, but we let that one go. Um, and he was charged with a gross misdemeanor furnishing alcohol to a minor. Obviously, a gross misdemeanor on her, his record was devastating. The state offered him a stay of adjudication, not because he, they couldn't prove the case, they could prove it, but because this kid had no record and we wanted him to have every opportunity to not have this on his record and eventually get an expungement. He took advantage of that. He pled guilty as soon as possible. He has had no further contact with the criminal justice system. And um, my concern is that that case, if this bill were to go forward as it's written, would have been reported to the BCA. That, that record would be there while my client's trying to obtain internships, and jobs until, unless and until he could get an expungement. So um, again, my concern is the over breadth of this bill as it's currently written. I agree with Representative Pinto that we could tailor this to um, involve CSC cases or even crimes against persons, something like that. But if I think about my clients who are possessing fake IDs, that's a big thing on campus right now, we're doing a campaign against that, um, they get stays of adjudication as well. Um, underage drinking, we get stays of adjudication on that. This is our future workforce, and I don't want to see them saddled with a record that is going to prevent them um, from being the best people they can be and the people we frankly need in our in our state. So I appreciate your time today, and I'm welcome or welcome any questions. Uh, Representative Dean. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Grossel. <clears throat> the 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 issues I think are all valid. <coughs> you know, issues, my concern is the reporting of all stays of adjudication to BCA. Uh, and when I, I looked at the disqualifying uh, offenses, it seems that they were either, you know, um, related to sexual conduct of some nature, child pornography or things like that, as well as drug crimes. And it includes misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor and felony drug crimes. So if it was possible to tailor this to exclude um, misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor on the drug crimes, I think it would be more amenable to me uh, because, you know, as the same way kids young, you know, gets a trace amount or a possession charge and five or 10 years later uh, has pretty much moved on with their life that this might still follow them even with the stay of adjudication. So if, if that's something you'd consider uh, moving forward, uh, Representative Grossel, I'm certainly happy to sit down and discuss that with you and see if we can't come to some type of agreement. But, you know, I mean, it's a very small population we're talking about, school bus drivers. 
Um, I, I think when we think of the numbers of cases that can, are gonna be impacted, I think they're probably gonna be a very small number, but I'm concerned too about 4.3 and 4.4 that requires all states of adjudication to be reported to the BCA. And I don't know if that was your intent, Representative Grassl. Mr. Chair, if I could refer to uh, research, if I may. <clears throat> In reference to uh, the stays, if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, it is for the period of the stay that, that they would be disqualified. That is for, it is for, for per, is permanent. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. And that's some, that's some conversation that I'm willing to have. Okay. You know, it's, uh, for me, uh, to protect our kids from a multitude of things, and one of them primarily being the video that he showed of uh, a predatory offender, a sexual predator from driving the school buses, that's the intent of my bill. That's the intent of, of what I want to protect them from. But like I said, it does not, uh, I, I, I see the points that you're making, and those are some conversations that, that can be had as well. But uh, to make sure that we do cover the, uh, the disqualifying uh, factors that do keep them from driving bus, you know, those are things to take into consideration as well. If someone is, a, uh, is in violation of any of these uh, misdemeanors or gross misdemeanors, there should be a time of, of uh, not being eligible to drive a school bus, I believe, and that is in order for them to get their lives in order. And I, it's, I, I, so I, I see the arguments that are being put forward and, and I'm willing to have those conversations. So. Uh, Mr. Neibel, do you have any? Mr. Chair, members, I just point out that the school bus driver in the CARE 11 piece, if it was, if he's only disqualified for the period for which his stay was in place, he would still have been eligible to drive bus in 2017. So if that's the intent of the, the legislature, there need to be major reform to the proposal. Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We often talk in our committee hearings, sometimes on the floor, about using an ax or a hatchet when we need a scalpel. And this strikes me as, as one of those opportunities to uh, use the scalpel and focus more intently on what the target really is um, and not cause unintended consequences to people who, um, as the testifiers have said uh, in their youth, inexperience, immature brains, do some stupid stuff and then they mature and we, we want and need these people to go on with their lives without the handicap of um, something hanging over their heads like that. So I'd, I'd appreciate it if we could look at amending this, uh, fixing it, changing it, to, to use that scalpel instead. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question of the chair. Uh, uh, Representative O'Neill, I had called on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yesterday or the day before in civil law, we heard uh, a new bill about Lyft and Uber and, and transporting people, and we talked about background checks extensively. Uh, we talked about what Minneapolis's ordinances and background checks and all of that. And, I'm, and I had to step out for a minute because I had constituents, but I was just wondering if we had this conversation yet about parity between what we're requiring in background checks for the school bus drivers versus Uber and Lyft here in Minneapolis and St. Paul um, versus taxi drivers. And, and I'm just trying to help, you know, since we just opened up this conversation a couple of days ago, I'm just wondering if we can kind of talk about what we're already requiring in the state for background checks and if this is more or less or if there's holes or all of that. And I I don't want to put nonpartisan research on the spot, but they may know some of that or maybe Representative Grossel might know. Representative, or Mr. Dibel. Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill, <clears throat> the general intent of the background statutes is to tailor them to the occupation for which the person is going to serve. And so in the case of a school bus driver, they start with all felonies and then they go to specific gross misdemeanors and misdemeanors that may suggest that they're not a reliable person to drive a bus. And so similarly, you look at other backgrounds, check statutes, they, they look at the crimes that may affect their ability to uh, 
perform that profession. And I, I frankly, I don't know if taxi drivers have a background check or not requirement, but um, that's really a civil law issue. And I believe this is going to the civil law committee to uh, take up and dealing with background checks, the substance and what's specifically included. Yeah. Members, this is going to civil law next. Representative Uglum. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was my question, and, and uh, I think it probably would have a chance for uh, an amendment uh, be, uh, to be considered after we've discussed all of these things and, and uh, move forward to civil law and get uh, do a little more work on the bill. Uh, members, if, once, it's, uh, once if it uh, goes through civil law, if we need to, we can always bring it back here as well. Representative Zerwaz. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, uh, Representative Grossel, uh, I like the bill the way it is. Um, and I think uh, one of the challenges is we've laid out disqualifying convictions within statute for the activity, the illegal activity. And if you're a convicted uh, drug user or you're a convicted sex offender um, or you've pled guilty to that as a part of a state of adjudication, the actual activity isn't what we're disputing. It's what attorney you got and what legal remedy you were able to find uh, on the way out. And so if as a legislature we're saying that that activity by that individual is too dangerous to be around children, then what the heck's the difference if you got a good lawyer and you ended up uh, pleading it down to a state of adjudication or if you just walked into court, faced your charges, and straight up pled guilty. The actual offense, the activity that you're copying to is the same. And so I have a, I have a real challenge uh, trying to parse out, you know, that this person should never be able to drive a school bus because they walked in and pled guilty to a prohibitive crime but that person should because they got an attorney and worked out a deal even though they did the exact same thing. And so I have an issue with, with, with starting to parse that out. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Zerwas, I need your help on the Uber and, Uber and Lyft bill. Okay. Um, I think that it is important that we take care of these um, background checks and that we make certain that we disqualify people who are unsafe um, to drive our children, whether it's in a taxi cab or whether <clears throat> it's on a school bus or whether it is um, in some other form. We have all sorts of disqualifications in the statute. And a lot of times it is about the underlying conduct. And if someone has admitted the facts on the record, um, there are certain offenses that we need to make certain that they are ineligible. And the question is, is is every single felony um, a reason to be disqualified from, um, from driving a school bus? Um, I prosecuted felony financial transaction card frauds. If somebody took their mom or dad's credit card and they used it illegally and mom and dad wanted to teach their child a lesson, um, in many instances you charge them with a felony offense and moms and dads don't usually want their kids to have records so they come in and say, you know, they, they learn their lesson but I don't want them to be scarred with a felony for the rest of their lives. Um, so can we get a stay of adjudication? If you report every stay of adjudication <coughs> felony, you'd be reporting those too and they'd be a disqualifier for, for driving a school bus. So I actually really appreciate some of what you're doing here and I really want to help you make it right because I want it to also apply to the Uber and Lyft drivers that we're gonna see in the bill and civil law as well. Um, and so um, I'd be happy to work with you between now and civil law to make sure that we get the language um, to reflect what you're really trying to do without telling every single person who's ever made a mistake that forever and ever you can't rehabilitate yourself. Because I don't think you want to exclude everyone. You want to exclude the ones that shouldn't be driving school buses. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I like the idea behind the bill, and I like what you're trying to do. But the one thing that I've heard that's kind of disturbing uh, is that this bill would not have impacted the guy from CARE 11. Um, so there's something that needs to get tweaked because the whole idea is to get that guy off the road. Is, did I misunderstand that, Mr. Yeah, it would have been, yes. What, what, what did you say? What did I misunderstand? Um, 
Mr. Chair and Representative Constantine, I was making the point that if the person was disqualified only during the pendency of their stay of adjudication, which is uh, one idea that was raised here, then that pers the person in the KR11 case would have already been restored to his rights and would have been eligible. But that's not the case under this bill. This bill, once you have a stay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. And that was really throwing me for a second. Yeah, no. Okay. My apologies. I misunderstood what they were saying to me. Representative O'Neill. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, again, back to Representative Hillstrom's point about Uber and Lyft and the taxi drivers and parity across. Um, I know that we were talking in civil law about a five-year look back versus a seven-year look back, and I was just trying to look through your bill really quickly. So when you talk about the background check, is it going back five years? Is it seven years? Um, can you just clarify that? I'll have to refer to uh, research on that, sir. Mr. Dyer. <coughs> Mr. Chair, Representative Neal, there's not a look back period in the school bus driver <laughs> endorsement that I'm aware of. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, I just want to note in response, I guess, what Representative Zerwas said that you know, we've been hearing from county attorneys and sexual violence advocates community and others that when you, that if you remove that that middle option of a stay of adjudication, um, you're going to get more convictions. Uh, but you're also going to get more um, cases that either aren't charged at all, result in dismissals, result, result in acquittals. Um, this is not removing that option altogether, but regarding some of these offenses, there may be um, some folks who say, um, you know, if some of these employment options are closed off to me, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree to a state of adjudication. And then we end up again, you have some more people are going to get convicted, and um, but some more folks um, will be the cases that won't result in the conviction. And so I guess uh, I feel like there's, it's a little bit of a balancing act that we're that we're uh, we're trying to strike here, whereas I see your point, we look at the conduct and that says what we want to do in terms of uh, the, the impact on whether somebody drives a bus or not. Um, but uh, if you block off this avenue, there'll be more people that won't have either a state of adjudication or a conviction when they may have some behavior that we would like to have them be held accountable for. So I just want to respond in that way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Grosson. In reference to some of these things that are being said, uh, Representative Dean made a good point. There's a very, very small uh, percentage of, of uh, occupations. And school bus drivers, uh, they're transporting our most precious cargo. Now, with that being said, you know, I'll, I will uh, definitely be taking into consideration everything that has been mentioned here. And uh, as far as uh, uh, what I would like to see behind the wheel of a school bus of 70, 80 children as someone that is very dependable. Now, uh, as far as uh, uh, people, uh, people going to trial for their bus driver's license or to get a bus driver's license, uh, I think that's maybe going a little over the top because uh, once again, you know, this is a very, very small uh, percentage of people and I don't think it's gonna overwhelm the courts uh, with uh, many, many more cases. But like, uh, again, I'm not discounting anything that has been presented here. And I'd like to speak, uh, speak further. Uh, here are some more ideas, which is, which has always been welcome. Uh, I'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd like to have that more often, but with a lot of my bills, that's been very difficult to, to get uh, people to come forward with, with help. Um, and I appreciate uh, Mincasa's uh, getting on board with, with uh, all of my bills here, but it, it uh, as, as Caroline said, it has been with uh, uh, much effort that we have gotten together and gotten on the same sheet of music. Uh, if there is more, if there is more fine tuning to do here, I'm certainly open and welcome to uh, anything that, uh, that would make this a better piece of legislature. Thank you. Any public comment for this bill? <coughs> Mr. Uh, Commissioner, Re Commissioner Evans? Superintendent Evans. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I just want to clarify one thing for you. I'm Drew Evans, Superintendent of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and it's been said a couple times to help clarify as you're considering this what a stay of adjudication does and does not do. A stay of adjudication is reported to us by the court. So the BCA, we've talked about record in a very broad terms when we're here. Stays of adjudication are reported to us upon arrest. 
what is considered and what Representative Grossel's bill is doing in this situation is it's clarifying if that information is provided to a potential employer. We have approximately 150 different disseminations based on statutes that are currently on law for background checks as you've just noted. What this does is we look to the statutes as to what information can be shared, whether a state can go out or whether a stay stays within the BCA. And so I just wanna make sure as you're going through this, we receive all stays of adjudication information now. What you're contemplating and what you contemplate with these bills is whether or not an employer is receiving that information as they make those decisions. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is unfair to ask you, but uh, if you could provide the, the committee with information at some point as to which of those you are already disclosing a stays of adjudication, if any, out of the 150. Um, and I, um, at some point, if you could provide me or the whole committee with what the difference is between the 150, that would be helpful, I think. Uh, Superintendent Evans. Chair and Representative O'Neill, we'll, I'll, I'll go back and talk with our staff about this. I recently had a conversation not in relation to this bill as to how we parse this out. We have a very large spreadsheet um, with with uh, criminal history trying to figure out what goes where and what we define as an open arrest as opposed to ding. But I, I agree these are, are issues for all of you to you know contemplate as you look at background checks across the board. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> uh, Representative Got Russell, do you want to re uh, renew your motion? I'll renew my motion, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and just one more thing, you know, just everything that I'm doing here is to protect our children. That is, that's the bottom line for me. And I know it's the bottom line for, for this whole committee. So it's... Uh, uh, I don't take offense to suggestions, you know. I've been a deputy for a number of years. I've had a lot of suggestions made to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't take any of them personally because, you know, that's, we can work through this. And I don't take offense to anything now. And I, I'm just hoping we can come out with a, uh, a very good piece of legislature for, for our kids. Well, thank you. With that, uh, Representative Gross will re-refer or renews his motion to re-refer House File 2934 to civil law. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. You're on your way to civil law. And with that, we will be adjourned until tomorrow at 1015.